Hello, and welcome to Zion Lutheran Church in Hollidaysburg, Pennsylvania, as we celebrate the second Sunday after Pentecost. Thank you for joining us. Just two announcements before we get going. First of all, Happy Father's Day to all you fathers out there. And secondly, uh, the church will have its church picnic on August the 21st at Chimney Rocks Park at 12.15 p.m. So if you would like that opportunity to engage in some fellowship, once again, that is, uh, save the date, it's October or August, August 21st, and that is at Chimney Rocks Park at 12.15. We ask that if you're going to attend, uh, and if you feel comfortable doing so, bring something to share, whether it's a side dish, a dessert, something, a drink, anything like that. So, um, so those are the announcements that I have. So let us now begin our worship. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Seeking reconciliation with God and our neighbors, let us remember the gift of baptism and confess our sin. God of mercy, we confess that we have sinned against you, against one another, and against the earth entrusted to our care. We are worried and distracted by many things, and we fail to love you above all else. We store up treasures for ourselves and turn away from our neighbors in need. Forgive us that we may live in the freedom of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. When we were laid low by sin and guilt, God made us alive together with Christ, forgiving us all our trespasses by taking our sins to the cross. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Let us rejoice in this good news. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O oh Lord God, we bring before you the cries of a sorrowing world. In your mercy, set us free from the chains that bind us and defend us from everything that is evil through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our gospel lesson today is from the Gospel of St. Luke, the 8th chapter. Glory to you, O oh Lord. Then Jesus and his disciples arrived in the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. As he stepped on land, a man of the city who had demons met him. For a long time he had worn no clothes and did not live in a house but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, what have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many times it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and would be driven by the demon into the wilds. Jesus then asked him, What is your name? He said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. They begged him not to order them to go back to the abyss. Now there on the hillside was a large herd of swine feeding, and the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was destroyed. When the swine herds saw what had happened, they ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then people came out to see what had happened, and when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. They were afraid. Those who had seen it told them how the one who had been possessed by demons had been healed. Then all of the people 
of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. I have often shared about the semester I had in college when I studied in Washington, D.C., and, and I was able to fulfill my lifelong dream of becoming a park ranger for the National Park Service, if only but for a four short month period, uh, a four month period. It was, it was short, but I loved it. It was an amazing semester, and it was really one of the best decisions of my life. However, that semester did come with a wart, or at least it came with three warts, roommates. Roommates that were worse than you could ever imagine. And I apologize if I have shared some of this story with you in the past, but uh, these details, this story, this, this event, this truly left a mark. Because of my roommates, there was not a single clean dish in that apartment. For weeks and weeks, I tried my best to keep up with those dirty dishes. I, I used the dishwasher that was sitting right there, uh, but my roommates did not. And it got to the point where I was just so sick and tired of taking care of those clean dishes that I would only do the dishes that I needed to cook, and then I'd leave them dirty in the dish, uh, in the sink, just like everybody else. It was disgusting, but that's how, we, that's how they lived. And because of my roommates, and because of that dish situation, I met my first cockroach in the flesh. And they're just as disgusting as the dirty dishes. But what else can you expect with that situation? Because of my roommates, uh, we had stolen patio furniture on our veranda overlooking the city. By the end of the semester, not one, but two complete sets that they stole from Chipotle uh, on their outdoor seating section. They somehow got away with that. Because of my roommates, I was asked to hide drugs. Uh, one of my roommates who was studying to become a lawyer thought that, you know, he was afraid that we would get searched and uh, was afraid that if he got caught that it would look bad, you know, when he was going for the bar examination later on in life. Uh, because of my roommates, I knew a drug dealer by name. And even though he was a nice guy, he still sold drugs uh, to pad his income and that's really deplorable. And because of my roommates, what truly was an excellent semester was tarnished. What do you do? What do you do when you don't want to be around people who you are stuck living with for four months? You know, I, I worked extra hours and extra shifts. I, I made friends outside of my apartment and the rest of the uh, semester, although they sometimes assumed that I was like them, even though I was not. I explored our nation's capital. I would get on the metro and go anywhere that I could uh, to explore the city. Uh, I would go to all those wonderful exhi exhibits and, and museums that are there for free. I, I did everything possible to get out of the walls of that building and uh, to be there as little as I could. That is how I survived. But what do you do if the roommates you have and the people that you do not want to be around are inside of you? What do you do when you can't simply just get away by stepping outside your door? What do you do when you don't just have one demon, but you have scores of them, a, a legion of them that possess you? How do you go through life then? 
this man who is in our gospel lesson, he has to be in the top five of the most pitiful people in all of scripture. He fled society, or perhaps he's been kicked out of society one way or the other, and he, he lives among the tombs, far off from the town people, far off <clears throat> from, from community. It's, it's unclear whether the people feared the man with the unclean spirits or if they feared the spirits that they supposed that lived in the cemetery, which one of those two entities they feared more but you can be guaranteed that they stayed away. It, this man, because of these demons, because of these unclean spirits, you can kind of read that he is, he is violent, he is uncontrollable, he is, he is naked, and they can't even keep him bound with shackles. And then there's the name Legion. Legion for many demons had entered him. In the time of Jesus, when the Roman Empire uh, was operating at the time of Jesus, a legion consisted of 5,600 soldiers. And that is his name. I mean, how do you even begin to comprehend the depths of this man's condition? He had a, a legion of mental illness, uh, a legion of addiction, a legion of, of physical disabilities and disease, a, a legion of brokenness, a legion of, of darkness clouding his consciousness, a, a legion of evil inside of what God created good. This legion of demons, no matter what form they take, no matter what we might call that in today's language, it's unthinkable. How do you break away from that type of situation? How do you kick out those unwanted roommates? For they had taken him over with brute force. And even though he cannot be subdued by iron shackles, he is bound by these forces that have taken him over. And just because you have broken free from your chains doesn't mean that you have freedom. In the story, it takes the wisdom and the action and the power of Jesus, of God incarnate, to restore this man to wholeness and to life. Jesus expels the demons. He does something that we can only fantasize about. But then Jesus goes one step further, one step further, and, and he does something that is even in our power. Jesus completes this miracle by restoring the man to community. You know, of the many lessons that, that we have learned over the past couple of years during, during the COVID-19 pandemic, we have learned the power of community. Community has to be one of the most important realizations that we have come to appreciate in these past few years. The loss of community during the pandemic, it exacerbated so many things in our culture. It, it exacerbated mental health problems and behavioral issues and our overall cohesiveness and wholeness. We need each other. We need each other to be well. And as long as as, as Legion is living by himself, away from society, away from other people, away in, this, in these tombs, he doesn't have a chance. When I was in college as, as a history major, uh, one of the courses I took was on the Vietnam War. And even though some of you lived through that, uh, and I, it's dangerous to you know, study something that other people have lived through. Uh, there was this really interesting part that that we looked at. It was some scholarly journals uh, and articles about addiction in in the army, in the armed forces, 
during the Vietnam War, especially when the draft was going on and when morale was very low on the soldiers who were stationed overseas. And, and you know that with uh, there's all of this uh, drug addiction that was happening in the armed forces and that was very concerning to the brass and to uh, the president and, and to the culture at large. You don't want a number of people who are addicted or who are using drugs uh, and are in a very sorry state to come home and to enter society and to continue those behaviors when they're back. And so there was uh, a drug test that was instituted on our, the armed forces. They had to pass a, a clean drug test in order to come back home. And in the common everyday vernacular, it was called Operation Golden Flow. And what was amazing and what we studied is that even though there was heavy drug use being done, being consumed by the soldiers overseas, that when they came back, as they left that hellscape of, of a context in, in the jungle warfare that was existing over there, as they left that situation and as they came back to the United States and entered back into their communities, the drug use fell off. Addiction fell off. There was no treatment. There were no counselors. There were no 12-step programs. Not everybody, of course, was so fortunate, but the vast, vast majority of the soldiers who transitioned from one culture back into the other, as they went from that horrible situation into their communities with pillars of support that surrounded them, the drugs, that drug use, discontinued. It's hard to find in any other situation that is the power of community. That is the power of the miracle of what community can do for people when it is working the way it should. And that is why Jesus sends this man named Legion back into his community so that he may be reintegrated and also share the good news of what God has done. Speaking of the power of community, recently Zion found the missing piece of a puzzle that we've been looking for for a long, long time for a, an organization called Bridge of Hope. Bridge of Hope is a nationally recognized uh, organization that helps people, families, uh, usually single mothers with children, uh, to get out of um, homelessness or to uh, stop going into a pattern that might lead into homelessness. And so we at Zion are happy that we have now a social worker to go alongside of what we are trying to do here at the church together with this organization, Bridge of Hope. And one of the ways that we as a congregation will engage is through something called neighbors. And a neighbor is a person, and we will have about 8 to 12 for whatever family we uh, sponsor. A neighbor will be trained, but also will be a social safety net uh, for this family to help surround them in all of these positive ways. Because once again, community has the power to heal. And so there is a system, there is a program, this, this nationally developed and recognized program to help fight homelessness and all of the problems that go with it by utilizing people to form an intentional community to bring about support. Because once again, community has the power to heal. And so if you are interested, if you are interested, if you are a person who likes to help other people achieve their goals, if you are a person who cares for other people's well-being, if that is a spiritual gift that you have, to surround people with love and care and to, to help them to move on to what is next, talk to me. Send me a message and let me know because we are looking for these neighbors. We are looking for people who, who feel like that is in their wheelhouse and I will gladly share with you more information. I believe that this idea of restoring people through community is an essential trait of who we are as the body of Christ 
It is one of the reasons why we are so fortunate because not only do we have God and not only can we tell each other what God has done for us and what Jesus has done for us, but we have the gift of each other and how God is using each other to continue to do good things for us. So let us extend that community. Let us extend that community and the gifts that it brings, not just for ourselves, but for everybody that we come in contact with, our friends, our family, our neighbors, our, and the strangers, even the people we have yet to meet. For community brings wholeness. And through that gift of community, we can bring the miracle of healing to all we meet. Amen. Now let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. I'll end each prayer petition with the words, Lord, in your mercy, and the responses, hear our prayer. Holy God, you hear the cries of those who seek you. Equip your church with evangelists who reveal the continuous call of your outstretched hands and your promises of home in you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You hear the cries of the earth. Restore places where land, air, and water have been harmed and guide us to develop and implement sources of energy and food production that do not destroy this earth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You hear the cries of those who are marginalized or cast out. Guide us continually toward the end of oppression in all of its forms and bring true freedom and human flourishing to all your beloved children. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You hear the cries of those who suffer. Come to the aid of all who are homeless, naked, hungry, and sick. Today we pray for Susan, Andrew, Taylor, Don, and Tom, for Doug and Kevin, for Mitch and Jim, for Eileen, Scott, Ray, for Lorraine, for Sandra, for Linda, and for all those we name out loud or in our hearts before you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You hear the cries of those who celebrate and those who grieve on this Father's Day. Nurture mutual love and tender care in all relationships and comfort those for whom this day brings sadness or longing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we give thanks for the faithful departed whose lives proclaimed all that you had done for them. At the last, unite us with them and make us make our home in you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now may the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. Dwell in peace. Christ is with you. Thanks be to God.